Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Genesis B. So I can give this to y'all gentle or I can give it to you blunt. Either way works for me, which one do you want? Blunt it is. It is not my job to explain the pain of scars that you will never see or the unfair situations in which you will never be. It shouldn't be my burden to help you see me as human. My opinion is valid. Or to explain away the trauma that is triggered by your malice. But I do have a job tonight here at this podium. There's urgency in my voice, agency in my words. I have the ability to create worlds, and my intention is to encourage. You, you who vote for rich men whose hearts are hollow, who disrespect your past and promise you tomorrow, your logic is hard to follow. Yes, you, who complain about federal government diminishing state rights, big government, big pharma, keeping you enslaved in the coma, that's karma. Dark clouds and blue haze so you can't see a light or a new day, true say, true say either unemployed or on opioids, relying on government assistance for your very existence. I know that it hurts. Trust me, I know. It's humiliating. It's debilitating. When your son needs rehabilitating, I pray for him. When my son is in prison and killed by cops, you telling me he deserves it. You telling me that he's worthless and you chiming in on the verdict. With your kids obsessed with violent movies, playing Call of Duty, immersed in false realities that manifest in shootings, escapism plus racism minus accountability. See, that's how you produce another Dylan Roof or Nicholas Cruz, another misguided youth recruited by white supremacist groups. Fake news, fake news. Fabricating lies and annihilating truths. Oof. Taught that all his faults are not his own. The blame is never his. Blame it on the gays, Jews, blacks, and Mexicans, and women. See, you and I are more alike than you'd like to admit. This whole American system is sick. Depression is rampant. We're addicted and jobless. Hmm. You're so quick to judge me as if you are flawless. You see, Mississippi is a microcosm of America. Middle America can't understand this. We are all reeking of cannabis trying to manifest dreams that we had as kids. You and I are in the same boat. you shooting at the bottom. You think that because you're white that there's no risk of drowning. These words I write are not out of spite. I often dream of a day that you and I will unite, fight the plights affecting both our lives, like healing our children, fighting addiction to alcohol and prescription, resisting government monopolies and wicked foreign policies made to benefit the rich, killing us with poverty. I'm just speaking honestly for those of you who can't. I'm spitting real since most of these rappers ain't. Bit in real since most of these rappers ain't. You see, I'm neither liberal or conservative. My allegiance is to the poor. My constitution is compassion. I hear the cries that you've ignored. We are too powerful now. You will never beat us again. Mm -mm. It's best to join us. <laughs> Cause we can teach you how to resist and we can teach you how to persist we can even teach you what it means when we clench and raise a fist. The concept of race is the greatest lie ever told. The human body, the human mind, the greatest resource ever sold. But as long as they can divide us, they'll continue to exploit. You fell right into the trap for fear that you'd be destroyed, clinging to an illusion of power like sand in a tightly clenched fist. So reality slips right through your fingers, 
putting us all at risk. The most cowardly of men are those who only fight out of fear. I said, the most cowardly of women are those who only fight out of fear. There's my beautiful home, great state of Mississippi. The hospitality state, our welcome mat is a battle flag. Let that resonate. Wonder why we rank last in the nation in healthcare, economy, and education. A nearly 40% black population, and you tell me that flag represents me. It flies in my niece's classroom. It flies in my judge's courtroom, siding with the legacy that says we are less than human. Deserving and capable only of servitude. Their words, not mine. Your founding fathers, their words, not mine. Do you see how Mississippi is a microcosm of America, though? My job tonight is to say this, and I'm going to leave it alone. My future friends, allow compassion to liberate you. <laughs> the death of the ego is a slow process. But start by asking yourself these questions. Why do I believe the things that I do? How is it poisoning me from the inside out? Why, with everyone else that I have blamed, have I still not found peace of mind, happiness, purpose? In what ways am I feeding the fire of bigotry? Why is it so hard for me to view humans as people rather than the labels that we've ascribed to each other or to ourselves? People, not things. Never have been, never will be. We are taught division from birth, y'all. I challenge each and every one of you, whether you're in the seats or watching online, to ask yourself these questions each and every day, because I do. Because we all play a part in the system of division, even me. Find your own accountability. Resist the concept of division. I call this conceptual resistance. Because the violence that you taught us just might come back to haunt you. Because we're tired and we're dying. And we're running out of options, frankly. And I promise you that when people of color come to power in this nation, which is inevitable, we'll have more compassion for you and your children than you ever had for us. I'm speaking to confused Confederates. I'm speaking to confused conservatives. And yes, I'm speaking to confused liberals. We are a part of you. We're taking note of your racist reactions and your silence, because audible is the injustices and the degradation that we face as Americans, as Mississippians, under that flag. Mississippi, America, it's time to take it down. Thank you. Wow, I hate following Genesis. Um, welcome everyone, uh, my name is Gabe Broadbar, I'm the Executive Director of the NYU Social Entrepreneurship Program. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome everybody in this room tonight, uh, and also welcome everybody who is joining us via the simulcast, which is being carried live and around the world by abcnewslive.com. I want to say a very special welcome and thank you to our presenting partners, Focus for Health, for their generous and catalytic support. Welcome to all of you to what I know will be a very valuable, and if you haven't already figured out, very honest conversation about race in America. Tonight's event is going to focus on Mississippi and the continuing terror their Confederate emblazoned state flag inflicts are not just many of the residents of the state, but indeed the entire country. Make no mistake, the Confederate flag is a symbol of hate, and it is a call to violence. It is no more a symbol open to a variety of valid interpretations than is a swastika or a burning cross. Tonight's conversation is framed by that thought and will not so much focus on the flag's origins and our country's racist history 
as much as it will focus on our racist present. We have an administration in the White House that is sympathetic and encourages white supremacist ideologies and acts. Murders perpetrated by white supremacists in the United States have more than doubled in 2017 compared to 2016. And the federal taxes that you and I pay continues to support the production and flying of the Confederate flag at official uh, state and federal functions. These are just a few of the many painful reminders of just how far we still need to go to realize what America is supposed to be. And we can realize a better America. If we didn't believe that, why would any of us have come out tonight? The simple truth is when it comes to racism and bigotry and hatred, there are absolutely no neutral players. You are either on the side of the oppressed or you are on the side of the oppressor. Silence, as we all know from Elie Wiesel, always serves the oppressor. So one question that we ask ourselves tonight is, what can we do tomorrow to not be silent? What roles, what actions must each of us take to change th things? That's our goal for tonight, to take a clear look at what is happening today and commit to doing something about it tomorrow. We're gonna hear from some extraordinary people who are leading a number of these critical calls to action. They hail from Hollywood, the media, academica, hip hop, and the law. Many are from Mississippi, and they all speak from deep personal experience. We're gonna have about an hour of conversation and then 30 minutes of Q&A with all of you. And everyone is invited afterwards to continue the conversation at a reception that will immediately uh, follow. Um, so to get things started, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Lisa Coleman. Dr. Lisa Coleman joined NYU as our first chief diversity officer, and she is leading the effort to make NYU a more diverse, welcoming, and inclusive institution. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Lisa Coleman. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's event. I'm so pleased to be here with you. Um, I would like to first thank the organizers, of course, Gabe and others who have organized this evening's event. And could we get another round of applause for Genesis B for her wonderful presentation. I would also like to thank uh, the unseen workers, the caterers, uh, the people who put out the chairs, all of those people as well, because they actually make the rest of us look good. So thank you for all of your work, and I see a couple of them back there. So as Gabe mentioned, I am the inaugural Chief Diversity Officer and Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion, Diversity, and Strategic Innovation here at NYU, and I am in my fifth month here. There is a lot to learn here at NYU, so the truth is I'm a little bit of a, in a startup phase, uh, which puts me right smack in the middle of social, social entrepreneurship. Um, one of the many reasons that I love working in higher education is because I get to work in a space where ideas are created, things are reimagined, molded, reshaped, torn apart, literally, verbally, theoretically, and then put back together again, whether it's engineers, artists, um, philosophers, physicists, etc. So what brought me to NYU is the very fabric of culture, arts, and science, and it's NYU's willingness to delve into the hard questions, hard questions like the ones we will be discussing tonight. What does it mean to be global in higher education today? What does it mean to construct a new future and to look into our very real past? What does a 21st century education look like? So NYU is exactly where I want it to be because for me, diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity is about imagination. It is about creating new possibilities. It is about creating social entrepreneurship that has an impact that will solve community-based problems through direct application. When I think back to the first Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, the period during which these here United States, sometimes not so united as we well know, would pull itself back together after militarization, confederacy, war, destruction, death, annihilation, murder, 
chaos, political strife. It was and is a difficult time, but it was also a time for imagination, to reimagine our country and ourselves better than we were or had been. It was a time to reflect, to come together across the differences, not to ignore them, but to actually delve deeper into what separated us. So tonight there will be much focus on the way we might use our art, our journals, our legal systems to tell our media, to tell accurate histories that embody the present past of all our communities. communities. We will talk about how to counter racism, xenophobia, sexism. We will talk about what facts are, what facts entail, what how we have re the site of where we are in terms of redefining the political landscape where we are in terms of poverty and in terms of police brutality and governance and the redefinitions that are emerging even as I talk tonight. We will talk about how to delve into these difficulties with our panelists and who defines these truths and who will define the future that we will embrace. As we attempt to reconstruct or construct our future, it will be precisely in the site of higher education where we will explore many of these ideas. It is at the intersection of new ideas that entrepreneurship programs are exactly placed. So it might sound cliche to say, be the change that you want to see in the world, but our panelists are exactly that. They have been and are change that they wanted to see in the world, and I am so pleased that they are here to join us tonight. My first role, and my only role now, is to introduce our moderator, Lumumba Akwonole Bandele. He's a senior organizer for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He is um, the senior community organizer, and he is also in, uh, responsible for the education fund. He has been a community organizer and educator in central Brooklyn, and from 19... 94 to 1998, he served as the programming coordinator at the Franklin H. Williams Caribbean Culture Center African Diaspora Institute. During his tenure at the CCC, he also co-founded Azabache, an organizer's training conference and workshop series for young activists. All the while, as a black studies major at City College of uh, New York University, CUNY, he went on to receive his master's degree in human service from Lincoln University in 1998. He is a member, as a member of the organizer with the Malcolm X grassroots movement, he helped to establish his campaign to counter police abuse and misconduct. He is also the co-founder of the world-renowned Black August Hip Hop Project. Uh, Black August raises awareness and support for political prisoners in the United States. From 2002 to 2007, he served as a counselor and lecturer at Medgar Evers College. And it is my pleasure to welcome him to the stage. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Good evening. All right, we're gonna try that one more time. Good evening. Good evening. Sounds a lot better. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is going to be a very lively discussion, a very participatory discussion, very engaging. And so I am going to just do away with the formalities. I'm going to ask our panelists to come out. I'm going to introduce them um, by name and title, and then we're going to jump right in so that we don't have to spend a lot of time reciting things that you can read. So please um, join me in welcoming the panelists uh, for this evening, actress and activist, Anjanou Ellis. <laughs> Hip-hop artist and activist, Genesis B, who you just saw. author and journalist, uh, Roland Martin. And last but not least, attorney Jeff Robinson. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Good. 
So we're going to open up, each of the panelists are going to give a very um, brief five minute opening remarks. Um, and then we're going to jump into some dialogue. So you should have some cards for questions that you want to ask. We ask that you write down your questions. Um, there's a process that we'll have to select those questions and we will have them read uh, during the Q&A dialogue. We good? Good. So I actually want to uh, start from my far left. Uh, Mr. Robinson will start us off and then we will work our way around. Good evening, everybody. I think sometimes it's, uh, it's useful. I'm going to stand up because I've been sitting. Uh, just to start with context, and uh, one of the books that I have read recently that keeps coming back to haunt me is George Orwell's 1984. And there's two things he said in that book. Who controls the past controls the future. If you control the narrative of what happened in the past, you control the narrative about what should happen in the future. And the second thing he said is, who controls the present controls the past. And what I would like to leave with you this, this evening is the thought that our history is literally being stolen from us right in front of our eyes. And so who better than a retired general to give consistent and believable remarks about military history in the United States? Well, this retired general had this to say. I would tell you that Robert E. Lee was an honorable man. He was a man that gave up his country to fight for his state, which 150 years ago was more important than country. It was always loyalty to state back in those days. But the lack of an ability to compromise led to the Civil War, and men and women of good faith on both sides made their stand where their conscience had them make their stand. If that is the truth about our past, then you can understand why people say about the Civil War and slavery, get over it. It's over. It's done. I'm simply asking us to examine that critically. The lack of an ability to compromise. America and white America has always been willing to compromise about the conditions under which they would own black people as property. We have the three-fifths compromise in the Constitution itself saying, these aren't real human beings, but we'll count them as three-fifths of a person. We have the 1820 Missouri Compromise. We have the 1850 Missouri Compromise. We have the Kansas-Nebraska Act. There was not a failure to compromise about how black people would be owned as property. I don't know what this general is talking about. And so what was it that these men and women of good faith, what was it that they believed in so strongly that they were willing to maim and kill American soldiers. Because let's remember, that's what the Civil War was about in one instance, the maiming and killing of American soldiers. What other instance do we recognize and lionize people who kill American soldiers? This is what Texas had to say. All white men are, and of right ought to be, entitled to equal civil and political rights. The servitude of the African race as existing in the states is mutually beneficial to both bond and free, and abundantly authorized by and justified by the experience of mankind and the revealed will of the almighty creator. And the state of Texas today is teaching its children that slavery was a side issue in the Civil War. Florida said, at the South and with our people, of course, slavery is the element of all value, and the destruction of that destroys all that is property. And the vice president of the Confederacy said it as clearly as he could, our new government is founded upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. We say today that the Civil War was about something other than slavery. I would simply encourage you to go to the facts. You can find out what every state who left the Union said about why they left the Union. So don't believe me or anybody else that's talking about this in 2018. Go back to the 1860s, because they were white supremacists, and they weren't embarrassed about saying it, like people today are embarrassed sometimes. Nathan Bedford Forrest had this to say, if we ain't fighting to keep slavery, then what the hell are we fighting for? And finally, I want to leave you with this. 
Where are these monuments? These monuments that we talk about. Well, there's half the country right there. And here's the other half. Those are the top 10 states. These monuments were built to honor people for what they did in one time period in America, between 1861 and 1865. And I want to talk to you about one of these monuments, just to give you an example. Thanksgiving Eve, uh, 1915, William Joseph Simmons went to Stone Mountain, Georgia, and he brought with him uh, bricks to build an altar. He brought an American flag. He brought a holy Bible, an unsheathed sword, and a burning cross, and he reinstituted the KKK in America. And this is what Stone Mountain, Georgia is today. The largest bass relief in the world. The north face of that mountain was ceded to the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1916, and they began work with the KKK to build that monument. They ran out of money, but in 1958, the state of Georgia said, don't worry, we're going to take taxpayer money, including taxpayers who were the descendants of slaves, and we're going to finish this monument. And this monument was finished in 1972. So here's the last thing I'll say. What does W.E.B. Du Bois have to say about Robert E. Lee and Confederate heroes? Because remember, every Confederate monument in America honors people for what they did between 1861 and 1865. When Trump says, are we going to get rid of the Washington Monument because he owns slaves? My response is, I don't think the Washington Monument was built because George Washington owned slaves. I think it was built because he started the country. <laughs> Here's what W.B. Du Bois had to say. People don't go to war for abstract theories of government. They fight for property and privilege, and that was what Virginia fought for in the Civil War, and Lee followed Virginia. He followed Virginia not because he particularly loved slavery, although he certainly didn't hate it, but because he didn't have the moral courage to stand against his family and his clan. And that is the punishment of the South, that it's Robert E. Lee's and Jefferson Davis's will always be tall, handsome, and well-born. Their courage will be physical, not moral. Their leadership will be weak compliance with public opinion and never costly an unswerving revolt for justice and right. It is ridiculous to excuse Robert E. Lee. Either he knew what slavery meant when he helped maim and murder thousands in its defense, or he didn't. If he didn't, he was a fool. If he did, he was a traitor and a rebel, not just to his country, but to humanity and humanity's God. Our history is being stolen from us, and if you don't educate yourself about what really happened in American history, our future is bleak. Thank you. I'm going to ask us to hold on to that slide of the mapping because we're going to come back to that during the discussion. I want to make sure we have that uh, back up. Brother Mo Roland Martin, please. All right, so how are we doing? Um, one of the things that I find to be very interesting is when um, Americans uh, love and live in denial. When I say they live in denial, let's just think about yourself. When you are having conversations about your own family, you are naturally going to be protective of your family. You're not going to be really, really honest if your daddy beat your mama or if somebody didn't take care of their kids. And so what happens is we like to have rose-colored lenses in terms of our own families. Well, that actually is the story of America. So Americans always, that's why you always, if you watch anything on Fox News, but you could go through this litany of things and they'll say, yeah, 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 but, but isn't America great? But even with all of that, have we done some more good stuff than bad stuff? That, that, that's always the fallback position. I mean, even this morning, I was uh, driving um, uh, to the train station, I was listening to Morning Joe, and they were talking about what's happening in Iran. They were talking about um, um, uh, dictators, they were talking about revolutionaries in Iran in terms of how they are and these radical revolutionaries. And as I'm listening to the conversation, uh, I'm sort of in the car laughing because uh, that was a point when Iran had a democratically elected government. That was 1953. 
until most of they decided that he thought it was quite unfair that Anglo-Iranian oil, uh, which is now known as BP, was getting 93% of all the profits from Iranian oil, and they were only getting 7%. And he said, that's kind of unfair, so we need, to, we need to get more money from our oil. And then BP said, hell no. But BP didn't want to go to war with Iran, but America said, hey, no problem, we'll volunteer ourselves. And so the reason Mossadegh was overthrown in 1953, the Shah of Iran was installed, led that country until 1979, until they overthrew the country in 1979. And those folks who were 18 years old in 1953 were in their 40s in 1979. But the problem is, if we have any conversation about Iran today, we always go back to the overthrow of the American embassy in 1979 and totally ignore what happened in 53. And when, in fact, if you read Stephen Kinzer's book, Overthrow, you will realize that uh, the Iranians loved America and looked up to America until we overthrew their country. So we're having a conversation today about Russia and what they did in terms of how the impact of the 2016 election. But if you go back and study what happened to Iran and Chile and those countries, we actually did the exact same thing in all of those countries. And so it's a little hard when America talks about how we uh, or how someone tried to overthrow our government when we, in fact, perfected that. That's just fact. That's not saying that, oh my God, uh, I mean, how dare you? No, it is saying this is the reality of this nation when a corporate giant ITT told the CIA, we will pay for you to overthrow Chile because they are messing with our business interest. I just got back from Hawaii, uh, I spent a week there. The Hawaii was the first country we overthrew. It was not always a state. We overthrew the country because they dared say they wanted more control over their plantations. I'm saying all of that because we literally have folks in this country who have no clue about the history of our country. And so we're walking around with our master's degrees and PhDs sound like utter idiots because we have only read his story and not history. And so when you begin to understand that history, then you understand where we are today. The Middle East would be different if America did not do what it did in the 50s and 60s under the Dulles brothers. It would be a different world. Exact same thing when you talk about the Confederacy. Now, there's somebody who will say, look, I, I, I hear you. They, they tried to build that thing in the early 1900s. Why is that big of a deal? Well, if you go to the United States Senate right now, the current United States Senate, you may not have any clue that the senior senator from the state of Mississippi sits at the desk of Jefferson Davis. You may not realize that this current, this Senate in 1995 authorized that for from here until eternity, the senior senator from Mississippi will sit at the desk of Jefferson Davis. That was in 1995 when they voted on that. If you put in right now in Google Jefferson Davis's desk, Senate desk, you will see there's a page dedicated to it. So in essence, in 1995, the United States Senate authorized the enshrinement of a monument to the greatest domestic terrorist and traitor in American history. If you are a young kid from Mississippi and you go to Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol, where every state gets to have two statues, and you go to your Mississippi statues, you will be taking a photo next to two statues of Confederate heroes. I say that because we have to get out of this idea that what happened in the past has no connection to what is happening in the present because the present continues to affirm what happened in the past. And that's one of the reasons why public policy is still impacting that way because we continue to pass, in essence, Confederate-type laws and policies 
by virtue of our love and appreciation for that period of history, which is still alive in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Genesis, please. I'm gonna keep mine really short because I've said pretty much all I need to say <laughs> for my intro. Um, but yeah, I, I guess my work in Mississippi kind of revolves around, and I just kind of stumbled into this work um, by a viral protest that happened in 2016 where I received a lot of harassment and backlash um, from white supremacists and misogynists and homophobics, alt-right. And it was all online, and I was having issues trying to understand this energy um, with people I've never met and could never see. I could not see the boundaries. What you did. Tell them why you made a man. Tell them what you did. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, at a, a sold-out show at SLBs here in New York, I draped myself in a full-length body Confederate flag and hung a noose around my neck and had a few choice words for Governor Phil Bryant, who decided to make April Confederate Heritage Month. Um, that's when he announced it in 2016, and uh, it, it still is Confederate Heritage Month in Mississippi. Um, somebody snapped a pic or uh, took a video and it, it went viral. Um, I couldn't see these barriers between myself and the people who were harassing me, and I wanted to. Um, I stopped doing public appearances for a few months and stopped doing shows, stopped rapping, and I kind of secluded myself and started painting the barriers. I started painting the, and, uh, the ledges and barriers because I needed to see them. Um, and then after that therapy, I realized what the barriers were. They were isms. I could tell by the things that they were saying to me. There, there was isms that were creating the barriers. Um, so after much needed artistic therapy, I decided to engage some of these people and it led to um, a documentary from the Moral Courage Project called uh, Confederate Pride, White Supremacy, and My State Flag. And at the end of this uh, documentary, it's only 20 minutes, you guys should check it out if you get a chance. I have a conversation with Lewis McFall, who was a childhood friend of mine. Like we rolled the bus together, had our little book bags and lunch pails, and uh, before either of us really understood the barriers that stood between us, him as a, um, white man growing up in Mississippi, myself as a young black woman growing up in Mississippi. Um, he is a son of Confederate veterans member. He decided that he would meet with me on camera and we had a beautiful, beautiful discussion. At the end of the discussion on camera, he says, you know what, I respect your decision to try to change this flag because I will not lose my heritage if that flag comes down. And it was just a very powerful moment and it led to him and I co-facilitating the next healing session where he brought people from his community, Confederate sympathizers, I brought people from my community who are on the opposite side of the flag issue, and we had another uh, very dynamic on-camera discussion. And this came from a very like violent, intense backlash from, from um, me saying what I wanted to say and me expressing myself. Um, so I guess the purpose of me wanting to do that is not so much to lend them a voice or amplify their voice in any way, but what it has done, it has uh, softened their hearts and opened their hearts because I don't believe in changing the minds of people in Mississippi. I think we have to change the hearts because I need you to see me as human first. See me as human, okay? See these people that I've brought to the table as human and, and hear why that is such a traumatic, triggering symbol for us see us as human first, because when that referendum vote comes around, hopefully soon in the next couple years, hopefully the next year, you know, I want them to say, you know what, I understand why these people want this change. It doesn't represent them. Maybe we can have a, a, a symbol that represents most of Mississippians, all of Mississippians. Um, so that's kind of my work right now, is people, not things. That's what I'm screaming to the day I die. That's the art exhibit that I'll be debuting this year and the album I'll be debuting this year is People Not Things. Um, and the point of that is trying to see each other as people rather than the labels that we have ascribed to each other and to ourselves. Let's start to break down that system of division one person at a time. I know it sounds like far-fetched and like a long road, but uh, it's the work that I've been called to do. Thank you.
ma'am. <laughs> this thing on. Um, first, I I um, I want to say um, something to each and every one of you in this room, and that thing is thank you. And the reason that I'm saying thank you to you is not some ceremonial gratitude. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. You took your time from whatever you were doing today in this beautiful 75 degree weather day and you came up in this room to hear us talk about Mississippi. And I cannot tell you what that means to me personally and I'll paint the picture. I appreciate um, so much the, 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 um, the scholarship um, and that has happened so far in this discussion and, and um, what Genesis has brought um, to this. What I, what I wanna talk about is family. And um, I, I do not have children of my own. I have a niece and nephew who I help raise with my sister. My nephew is nine years old, he's an autistic child. He's the love of my life, everybody knows it, even my boyfriend. Um, my niece is five, um, she's uh, about to start kindergarten. They are the love of my life. I could not love them more if they came out of my womb. I was raised by my grandmother um, who passed away in uh, 1995 and my mother uh, who is a, uh, just think Grace Jones, that's all I'll say. <laughs> now, these people are incredibly important to me. They are, they are the reason that I do this work. The fact of the matter is, my niece and nephew have to walk by a Confederate flag every day in order to go to school, in order to get an education. They have to walk by something that tells them that they are less than human, that their value is chattel in order to get an education. So, what you have said to me by you coming in this room is not just, oh, I'm interested in race. What you're saying to me is you're, you're interested in helping me protect my family. It's that basic. What Genesis described, um, people threatening her, this is what we live with in Mississippi. People doubt that there is a, a voice of resistance in Mississippi, and that's a lie. That's a total absolute lie, and, and Lumumba will talk about that later. That's an absolute lie. I'll give you an example. When what happened, in, when Heather Heyer was killed in Charlottesville over the summer, there were tons of conversations that happened on CNN. And whenever they had someone from Mississippi or someone referenced Mississippi, inevitably they would say, well, Mississippians have the Confederate flag and they like it. They voted to keep it. 80% of them want the Confederate flag. The devil is a liar. That's not true. There was a vote in 2001, a very cynical vote that happened in 2001. 30% and it, it, it went down uh, the demographics of it went down uh, according to the race. 30% more, you're mainly African Americans, 30% in Mississippi. Those are the people who voted against keeping the flag and the rest of everybody voted to keep it, right? So when people say that folks, that's what folks want, that that's what the South wants, that's what Mississippi wants, first of all, hear me right now, that is not true. That is not true, that is a lie. There is a huge voice of resistance. The problem is what has prevailed in Mississippi, because Mississippi has operated in isolation and oblivion almost since its next inception as a state in this country post-Civil War, because it has operated in isolation and oblivion, what has prevailed in Mississippi is a culture of fear. People are afraid. People are afraid to speak out. People are afraid to speak against. So when you have fools like me in Genesis who don't, who like, I, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen, but I'm gonna say what I'm gonna have to say. We are rare, but it doesn't mean we don't exist. The problem is, and this is why this, is pan, this panel discussion 
is not a panel discussion. Hear me when I tell you, this is not a panel discussion. I don't wanna have another discussion about race. We've been doing that forever. I'm not interested. What I want is action. When you walked in that room, I'm sorry, but you are a participant now. Sorry, but you are. Because when this is over, I'm gonna give y'all some stuff that I want y'all to do, okay? So we have this voice of resist, these voices, these bodies labor, laboring in resistance in Mississippi, fighting back, been fighting back generationally in Mississippi. What you got people who are afraid, and you got people who are tired. But what we don't have, right, what we don't have and what we have been missing for so long is you. You, people outside of Mississippi who say, you know what, are you kidding me? The flag of the KKK is the official flag of a state in this country? Really? I will not stand for that. And here's the other thing. Everyone in here is a part of the problem. You know why? Because that flag does not just fly in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever been in Union Station in DC? Anybody, raise your hand. Tell the truth. You pass by the Confederate flag. You pass by the KKK. Yes. If you've been to the Building of States, Roland Martin had his show in the Building of States in Washington, D.C. He had to walk by that flag every day to go to work. Every day. So this is not Mississippi's problem. This is an American problem. Now say this and I'm, and I'm done. Mississippi, hear me out is the petri dish from which the present, present administration formed. Everything that happens in Mississippi, Southern pride, Southern rights, states' rights, all those terms, born and bred in the Confederacy, born and bred in the South, right? All of those principles put President Trump in office because we sat back for years and ignored it. Real, not realizing that it's uh, uh, cancer and it's spreading. So, okay, I said what I had to say. We are all, this is, a, this is not a panel, this is a call to action, and I thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So, we're gonna engage in some dialogue right now, and I'm glad that Anjanu really brought us back in setting a tone about how we want to have this discussion. It's not a mistake that we have representatives from Mississippi here. Part of the problem is when we have these discussions, typically we're talking about something somewhere else without people who have lived those experiences, right? So I want to make sure that we root this conversation with that understanding and with the respect of those who have actually lived those experiences, but also understand that what we're doing today also is trying to relearn what we think we know about Mississippi. I had the privilege of spending about two days down in the Delta last week. And it's a very inspiring uh, uh, place to be. To be in a place where county after county, pocket after pocket, there's black political power, believe that, electoral political power, and we can talk about how that actualizes or not is another question, mm -hmm. but it exists. But equally as important is a very rich history of resistance, of struggle, and of freedom fighting in places that we may have never heard of. But they inform not only the civil rights movement, but they inform movements around the world. So I want us to be able to put that particular bit of information to the center of this discussion so we aren't talking about Mississippi from some sort of deficit kind of position. Mississippi is rich. It's rich. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why Mississippi is the way it is in a little bit. But I wanna flip right back to Anjanu and then I, Brother Roland really quickly. You talked about why all of this is happening. Talk really quickly about the campaign. What specifically this campaign of trying to remove the flag, how did it come about and where is it now? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, um, what we, we have done in uh, the last last few years, is um, you've done several. We've done done several things, and I can only speak to the work that Genesis Genesis and I have been been involved with. But there are lots of people in Mississippi who who are doing this kind of work um, all over the state of Mississippi. We had a rally at on the on the on the on the uh, Capitol building uh, grounds. Uh, 
We had a rally in front of the SEC in Alabama. We've had, we've had rallies all over the place. We had rallies at the Capitol building. We have rallies, 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 rallies. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're, doing, we're doing the work, you know. The, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we're dealing with a, we're dealing with such entrenched arrogance on the part of the leadership in the state of Mississippi. Governor Phil Bryant, the Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves, um, both of them insist on this flag continuing to fly. So you have these pockets of people trying to hit it at all these different levels. And um, what the thing about it is, is that these folks are, you know, they don't want it to change. The, the thing is, is that for them, the flag, God, and family are the same thing. Mm -hmm. So if you criticize one, you're criticizing God. If you're criticizing the other, you're criticizing the family. They're all, they're, it's, a, it's a trinity. It's a trinity, and it's, it's very real. So that's, that's, a, that's a hard wall. That's a hard wall to push. Um, and this is why we're doing things like this. Because we, we know that we cannot do it alone. If the vote happens tomorrow, it's still going to you know, come down on, 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 on those percentages. And that's not, we're not going to win like that. The fact of the matter is, Governor Phil Bryant needs to take the thing down. He doesn't need a vote. The first, and we all know this, y'all know this, the first way for somebody to be denied of a civil right is to put it to a vote, right? I mean, we still would not have same-sex marriages if it were left to the states to vote on it. So that's the reality. Um, and I'm gonna leave it there and we'll, I'll come back to it. But I think she said, Arjuna said something earlier that I think you have to listen to again and how it applies to even white politicians. So she talked about fear in Mississippi. I have not talked to the current governor or the previous governor, but do understand from a political standpoint, there are white folks there who are also fearful because they're fearful of losing. So they keep defending something so they can maintain political power out of fear that, oh, we might lose. So really what, you, what it requires is actual courage um, upon those white officials to say, you know what, if you want to vote me out, fine, but I'm going to take a different position. Now, let me, let me stay on the, the point of, of white fear. And somebody may disagree with me, and that's fine. But and I'm not letting I'm not letting anybody white off the hook. But I need you, need you, need you to understand that just like African Americans have been oppressed when it comes to knowledge and narrative, so we have white folks in this country because it is by design. So March 25th, 1965, Dr. King gives his speech in Montgomery after the Selma March. This is what he actually says. He says, toward the end of the Reconstruction era, something very significant happened. That is what is known as the populist movement. The leaders of this movement began awakening the poor white masses and the former Negro slaves to the fact that they were being fleeced by the emerging bourbon interest. Not only that, but they began uniting the Negro and white masses into a voting bloc that threatened to drive the bourbon interest from the command post of political power in the South. To meet this threat, the Southern uh, aristocracy began immediately to engineer this development of a segregated society. I want you to follow me through here because this is very important to see the roots of racism and the denial of the right to vote. Through their control of mass media, they revised the doctrine of white supremacy. They saturated the thinking of the poor white masses with it, thus clouding their minds to the real issue involved in the populist movement. They then directed the placement on the books of the South of laws that made it a crime for Negroes and whites to come together as equals at any level, and that did it. That crippled and eventually destroyed the populist movement of the 19th century. So what, what am I saying? You have been taught his story and not history. So therefore, you're living in actual denial and ignorance of what actually took place in this country. So therefore, when the folks say, this is my heritage, what they're actually articulating is simply what they have been taught generations over and over and over again. So they are running around saying, oh, I don't understand why you're telling me this is bad because this is actually, this is no my history because it's been pounded in their head. So part of this piece is how do you break down this, this huge wall of ignorance that's based upon lies? 
So somebody might be saying, okay, but how do you still do the connection? Okay. We know about the apartheid movement today. We know about the divestment. Some of you probably say, oh my goodness, Harvard and NYU and all of these campuses, they had all of these rallies and they had the shanties and we had them at Texas A&M and that's what did it. But many of you don't ask what started it. It was when a black worker named Ken Williams walked into the Polaroid building and he saw something called the passbook. The passbook was the document that was used in South Africa that black people had to present to show their papers. Polaroid made the passbook. He said, wait a minute, Polaroid, you are aiding the apartheid regime. He began to protest that. A 25-year-old sister who was a chemistry major, Carolyn Hunter, she began to join with them. Her mama said, baby, look, you got a good job. You went to school, you were a chemistry major. She said, mama, no, this is important. They eventually get fired, but that leads to them starting the Polar Polaroid Revolutionary Workers. They started the divestment campaign. They connected the passbook through Polaroid to apartheid. That's what started the money. So the flag is living today. So when the woman running for governor on the Republican side in South Carolina today said a month ago, I love my Confederate history. They fought for the state power. This is the woman who could be the next governor of South Carolina. So we have to connect how flag in the Confederacy unites with history, political power, and then go, we have to be in the business of actually educating folks who look like us to say, no, what you thought you knew about history is not the reality. So we can spend lots of time trying to get somebody excited and trying to get them to our side, but if they have lived for 30, 40 years and multiple generations with a set of knowledge, they're gonna keep thinking that because they know nothing else unless you learn the other side of history to then educate them. And, the, and by, by you, I mean somebody who doesn't look like me because when you are sitting there with your classmates and family members and then now you begin to break it down, they go, ah, it's different from you than it is from anybody who looks like us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So here's a few things that I think we're touching on and I want us to really look at what's at stake here, right? We're looking at a small population of folks, relatively speaking, who are holding on to what they consider to be a, a sacred symbol, right? Why is that? What particularly is uh, at stake what particularly are people afraid of? Because when we, we had this discussion backstage and we were talking about the Black Belt South, we talked about the connection of all of these different counties, all of these different places and pockets of very important black political uh, uh, historic spaces, right? What are folks afraid of in terms of letting that particular symbol go? And I also want you to talk, if you can, a little bit about the contemporary piece, like where are we right now? I want Janice, if you can jump into that real quick. Here. Um, I don't know what's at stake for those who want to keep the flag there other than what I've been told by a few who I've interacted with. I don't know how everyone feels, so I won't make a generalization. Um, loss of identity. Uh, a lot of white people in America, um, many don't feel like they have a heritage to be proud of. Like everybody has a struggle, right? Everybody has a struggle. Um, that's what defines a lot of us. I have a lot of struggle and trauma and triumph in my family and it defines me. It's why I'm here doing what I do. The great rebels. My grandfather was a rebel. He was a Confederate soldier. He fought against Goliath. That's something that they are proud about. Um, so I think that they think that they will lose their heritage or somehow that is um, diminishing their heritage and the history of their forefathers, I mean, uh, their ancestors. Um, like I told Lewis, I said, my protest wasn't to disrespect your ancestors per se, but I will not apologize because look what your ancestors did to mine. Some past and some history, some heritage, you should not be proud of. So, but what, what is at stake for us? That's 
That's the question, okay. <laughs> um, our lives. Uh, there's a case that I want some, uh, these, everyone in the audience to look up. Uh, Henry D. and Charles Moore is a famous case. Um, they were murdered, they were tortured in the woods, they were picked up while hitch hitchhiking in Mississippi, um, in Franklin County, um, I believe it was Franklin County, in the mid-60s, uh, by a police officer named um, Seal. And he recently faced justice in 2007. They, after all these years of living his life as a very old man, he faced justice and got convicted. But these, these kids were mur murdered and tortured and they were trying to figure out who's running guns into Franklin County to arm the black citizens against the KKK because lives were at stake. Many lives had been killed, lynched way before that, but they yelled out my grandfather's name, Reverend Clyde Briggs. And I'd like for you all to um, look this up because months later, my grandfather was dead. He was 42 years old. Many in our family believe he was poisoned because he was such a powerful pillar in the community, very powerful in terms of um, community organizer and preacher. Uh, he came home with symptoms. Uh, within two or three hours, he was gone. Um, the day after they tortured these boys, they went to my grandfather's church and dug up the floorboards looking for guns. They didn't find anything. But what I'm trying to say is our lives are at stake. Um, I'm doing groundwork in Mississippi. I might not be here to speak to you all. You might not see me next year. My life could be taken from me. This is, this is my reality. This is what I live with. This is what Anjanu lives with. This is what people in Mississippi who uh, don't have the backing and, and the help from outsiders in Mississippi uh, we have to face this. Like You have to face the threat if you're gonna try to make any sort of change. Um, but many are silent because of the fear and intimidation that is there. So when, I, when you ask what's at stake, literally my life. You said there's a small contingency. This is not small. I, I need you to understand this is not Mississippi. There are 37 Democrats from the South in Congress. Only 15 are white. There are more than 100 white Republicans from the South. That means that if you need 218 votes to pass a bill in the US House, white Republicans from the South make up almost half of all votes. So the flag and the ideology informs a party's politics. This is a public policy issue. What the flag represents, what the ideology represents, is infused in criminal justice reform, is infused in welfare reform, is infused in tax reform, is infused in attacks on labor, which if you look at uh, even right now, African Americans have been able to get out of, uh, in terms of increase our wages by virtue of unions. And so, what is the most anti-union part of the country? 12 Confederate states. So, we have to stop thinking this is just a Mississippi thing and realize that that thinking literally impacts public policy, and not just public policy, impacts who sits on the federal bench, who sits on the Supreme Court, so that thinking impacts every single one of you because when they are driving public policy, they are passing bills that will impact your children, your children's children. So don't think this thing is just one small state. No, this is American politics. Right, so we have q and I understand there's some cards that are coming up. Okay. <laughs> okay, so while we're doing that, can you talk a little bit about some of the litigation strategies that um, you are looking at to impact the flag coming down? I don't want to say too much about litigation strategies. Because <laughs> okay. uh, they're strategies. Because they're strategies. <laughs> but what I will say is this. Uh, the bust that you saw of Nathan Bedford Forrest is what I have to walk past if I go to my home state of Tennessee and want to go to the state house to see a state representative, to see the governor, 
to see any elected official. If you walk to the State House in Nashville, Tennessee, the bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest is there to greet you. Uh, when these monuments are on private land, there's essentially nothing anybody can do about it. I am free if I want to go to my home uh, or my apartment in downtown New York and put a Nazi flag on the outside of it, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. I actually have that right in America. And I'm not suggesting that we, uh, at that level, are dealing with a, a quote-unquote free speech issue that's significant. The issue is, is this. When taxpayer money, including money paid by the children of African slaves, when taxpayer money is used to put up a monument that is representative of the Confederacy, and once again, I would really challenge you, if you looked at that Southern Policy uh, Law Center map, they've identified 1,503 Confederate monuments in the United States, and that's not all of them, but it's, it's the vast majority of them. Take a look at your history. Every single monument is dedicated not to something somebody did after the Civil War. It was for 1861 to 1865. I've said that several times because it's important. There is only one thing that people did between 1861 and 1865, and that's maim and murder American soldiers so that they could keep the right to own people as property. So when I hear people from the South say, the Civil War wasn't about slavery, it was about states' rights, my response is, that is absolutely correct. It was about the right of the Southern states to maintain human beings as chattel. When I hear them say it was about Southern culture, that is absolutely correct. It was about the culture of white supremacy. It is one thing when white supremacists are marching around on their own when the government puts its money behind white supremacy, we have a 14th Amendment that says that's not correct. We actually have a 13th Amendment that says you can only enslave people once they've been convicted of crimes. So we are definitely looking at legal strategies to attack the use of Confederate monuments on public land paid for with public money. And I'll give you one example. In my hometown of Memphis, Tennessee, when I was five years old, I remember my parents freaking out at me because we drove past a statue of what I saw was a guy on a big horse. It was Nathan Bedford Forrest. And I said, oh my gosh, mommy, daddy, who's that guy on the big horse? And all of a sudden, what had been a very pleasant day got absolutely <laughs> silent because they didn't know what to say to me about what that represented. They didn't know how to explain to a five-year-old what that statue represented and why it was there. There are community activists in Memphis, Tennessee, African-American women who have been after the Confederate monuments to Nathan Bedford Forrest and Jefferson Davis, and they have harassed, and I will use that word deliberately, the elected officials in Memphis to do something. What they finally ended up convincing the mayor of the city and the entire city council to do Tennessee, like many southern states, has a law that says you can't remove a Confederate monument if it's on state property. Tennessee has the Tennessee Historical Society, and you have, to move, you have to go to the Historical Society and say, may we remove this monument? And you can imagine the answer you get from the Historical Society. Well, Memphis came up with a plan. The city sold the parks where these two monuments were to a not-for-profit agency. They sold it at 10 o'clock at night. By 10.30, the Memphis police had both parks surrounded and equipment was there to remove those monuments. And one of my favorite pictures for the rest of my life will be a Memphis City police officer, a black man, standing watching the monument of, of uh, Jefferson Davis coming down with a smile on his face like this. <laughs> so, and, and Alabama passed that same law last year. And my point is this, the ACLU and other legal organizations can absolutely get involved. 
Those monuments in Tennessee would not have come down with pressure from the ACLU if that was the only thing. It was the people in that community who put themselves on the line that made those elected officials finally have to face the facts. So I think that what you will see in the coming months is our attempt to target Confederate monuments that will resonate with the rest of the country. And I just don't want to say more than that because I- How are you going to deal with Mississippi and the flag? What's oh, the ACLU's position with Mississippi specifically in that flag? That flag is on government land. Yes. That flag is paid for with government money. Yes. And so uh, what I can say to you is there have been discussions about your state flag in my national office. And there is an affiliate, an ACLU affiliate in Mississippi, and they've been in those discussions as well. So we know exactly where Mississippi is, and we know exactly what's going on there. I promise you that. We need to know it. Good. So here's what I want you to do, Anjano, because I want you to actually chime in, but also want to pitch this other question to you uh, from the audience. Uh, do we believe that taking down a Confederate monuments will have an impact on the conditions of black African Americans? If so, how? Who asked that question? <laughs> There's no name on it. So. Can, can the person who asked that question please? Okay. Why did you ask that? Um, I guess with the fact that um, unarmed black children are being murdered by the police, right? So there's, in my mind, I'm thinking this is, of course, these flags should come down, right? But mm -hmm. there's a question in my mind as to what comes first. There's so much to tackle. Right? There's so many problems here. So I'd love to hear from you. Do you know who Dylan Roof is? A little bit, please. OK. Dylan Roof was a teenager, right? Was he 20 yet? I have no idea. He was 19 at the time of the He time. was 19. He walked into a church in South Carolina, a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and just shot everybody in there. That's who Dylan Roof is. Okay, the reason why Dylan Roof went and shot those people is because he was a Confederate. He was a neo-Confederate. What you will find when you look at pictures of Dylan Roof on Facebook, you will find he will be waving that flag. That flag gave him a mandate to kill black people. Have you ever heard of someone named Scott Michael Green? Scott Michael Green was a white man in Iowa. Scott Michael Green killed a police officer. Weeks before that, Scott Michael Green went to a football game and waved the Confederate flag. Scott Michael Green was given instruction to do his crime, the authority to do his crime, by the Confederate flag. The Confederate flag is not a piece of cloth. It is a mandate. It is a directive. It is an instruction to terrorize American citizens. It has always been that from its inception. And that is its danger. And that is its urgency. Can I say something about this? Because I think it's. It, Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But I, yeah. I want to say something really quick because I think what she's asking is okay, say tomorrow the flag comes down by federal pressure then those racist minds are still there. They're still venerating that flag. They still have that mandate. She's asking what comes first, attacking the racism at the core or bringing down the flag, and will that help facilitate that breaking down of race? Is that what you're asking? But, 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 he, but, here, yeah. but here's why that's any, uh, nothing against you, because first of all, Charles Barkley said the exact same thing. Here's why the question is irrelevant. He said earlier, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment were Reconstruction Amendments. That was the Civil Rights Act of 18, uh, 1878. Okay, you did not have another one. The Supreme Court invalidated that in 1883. You didn't have another one until 1957. And so, black folks didn't say, "Well, hold up, until we able to get this right and this right, we need to do this one first. No, he actually wanted all of them at one time. They came out piecemeal. So I would say this here: What's more important? to test untested rape kits or for women to get paid the same rate as a man? 
if you're a woman, you're like, shit, I want both. <laughs> so black folks are saying, we're not trying to choose. Damn it. We want unarmed black folks not killed by cops. We want uh, high quality education in schools. We want in racism, Confederate stuff. We want all of it. We are not enough with us having to pick. Just like, do understand, didn't America celebrate when, they, when, the, when, the, when the Iraqis tore down the statue of Saddam Hussein? Mm -hmm. We celebrated. We were like, that's it. Why? Why did America celebrate when the statue of Saddam Hussein came down? Because we understand what statues mean. And so we're not trying to pick. While you have a group fighting to remove symbols, you have folks fighting for high quality education. We can do all those things at one time, but it means something because as long as there is a symbol of oppression, oppression will be codified in our laws, in our public policy, in our schools, in our businesses. And as long as we stay silent to allow them to stand, then it will manifest itself in other ways, and then we'll say, well, why those things still exist? Because you allow all of that to still exist. Also, also, I think people need to understand, like, very specifically, that that flag is not a symbol. It's not a symbol. It's not a symbol. It's real. It's, it's, it's an instruction to take life. It's, it's someone, it's the voice that whispered in Dylan's roof ear. Like, you can go in here and kill all these black folks because they're not human being. I think if you think about it, if every Confederate flag came down tomorrow, not one person would get out of prison. It wouldn't feed anybody. But what it does is to attack the creation story that America is so desperate to hang on to. And our creation story is that it's all about freedom and justice and equality. And if you say to most Americans, America was established on the concept of white supremacy. It was the founding concept of the entire country. People will say, that's ridiculous. And my response is, go back and look at the history. And that's why I think the historical record is so important. Because the historical record, I said earlier, our history is being stolen from us, right in front of our eyes. And when Ben Carson stands up and says slaves were immigrants who came to this country with dreams of prosperity, it is. It is funny until it's not. Right. This man is a cabinet level official of the United States government saying that slaves were immigrants. And if that's true, then our story about what we need to do about race in this country today is majorly impacted. So those flags are, I agree, they are not a symbol. They are a representation of white supremacy that people have been holding on to for a myriad of different reasons for generations. Just real, just real quick, just real quick, I just need to remember this one thing. At the end of the Civil War, Lee said, furl that flag. It is a symbol of oppression said to the soldiers to store it in your attics. The, that flag disappeared from American life for two generations. It reappeared at the Dixiecrat Convention in Mississippi in 1948. Why? Because under Harry Truman, the Democratic Party was considering a civil rights plank. So the flag was brought back into American society to specifically oppose civil rights for blacks. It was raised on the state capitol in South Carolina specifically to opposition Brown versus Board of Education. So the reason the flag re-emerged in American society was because of black demand for black freedom. So if that's the reason why it came back, that's why it needs to come down. Just two seconds, just two seconds. I just wanted to say thank you for asking that question. There's no such thing as an irrelevant question because all of these poignant points came from this, and this is what we want. We want open dialogue and people to feel free like they can ask questions because we are here to educate and we are here to share our perspectives. Um, 
you asked earlier about earlier about education. Um, in December of uh, last year, uh, Mississippi opened a civil rights museum, um, and uh, the ground the, the groundbreaking ceremony of the civil rights museum happened in 2013, and Miss um, Murley Evers the the wife of um, Medgar Evers. Are you, are you guys familiar with Medgar mm -hmm. Evers? Uh, who was assassinated in, um, in Mississippi. A veteran. Yes. And um, Met Merle Evers was standing uh, with, along with present and former governors. And she had a smile on her face. She was so happy. She was saying, in the words of Michelle Obama, I'm so proud now. Finally, I can be proud. Surrounding Ms. Evers were Confederate flags. They were everywhere because she was surrounded by the Mississippi State flag. They were everywhere. Imagine them being flowers all around her, right? And they were breaking ground on a civil rights museum, right? Okay, four years later, in December of um, this 2017, they opened the, the Civil Rights Museum. And on the entirety of the campus, you know what's absent? Did anybody take a guess? You know what's not there? The state flag. Right, is that, I mean, y'all might be like, yeah, that's cool, great. They, they, didn't, they didn't fly the flag. That's not why the flag wasn't flying. Because on the campus, the flag is not flying. But if you were there, they were everywhere else. If you looked up in the sky, it was, it was flying on the Capitol building. If you looked to the left, it was flying on the, at the governor's mansion. If you looked to everywhere around it. The reason they didn't fly it is because they were embarrassed. Now, everybody thought that most of the people who were protesting that day were protesting because Donald Trump came. Right? And they thought, like, how could they desecrate this great place with Donald Trump's presence? But it was some other folks out there protesting. And we weren't protesting Donald Trump. We were protesting the museum itself. And the reason why is this. These men stood on that stage next to Miss Murley Evers. Right? Let me tell you this other part. I'm going to shut up in a second. There's a civil rights museum, OK? Right next to the Civil Rights Museum is a Mississippi History Museum. And the reason why the Mississippi History Museum exists is because they didn't want the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum existing by itself. So the state of Mississippi said, well, we'll give you this platform to condemn us, mm -hmm. but we're going to give us another platform mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to celebrate us. It is the articulate. The art architecture is the articulation of Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. On that day, when we were out there protesting, not Donald Trump, but the flag, I got into a lovely conversation with this man. And I thought he was on our side. So I was like, hey, thank you for coming out and joining us. And he was like, no, that's not why I'm here. And I said, well, wait a minute, what's, what, what, what? He said, y'all got all this wrong. He said, that's not why my, my ancestors fought in the war. They, we, did, we didn't even own slaves. That's not, that's not why we did that. We, we just wanted to hold on to our homes. And then I asked him, I said, have you ever read the Mississippi Statement of Secession? And he they said, um, no, <laughs> what, is, what is that? So this is what I read to him. And this is the Mississippi Statement of Secession. All right, y'all listening? OK. The, the founding fathers of the state of Mississippi, these were their words. Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery. The greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce of the earth. These products are peculiar to the climate verging on the tropical regions, and by an imperious law of nature, none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun. So I asked him, I said, did you know that that was the language? So soldiers fight for their own personal reasons, mm -hmm. but nations declare war. Right, right. 
for official reasons. And that is why the Confederate state of Mississippi declared war. That is why, those were their reasons. Because they wanted to maintain slavery and they wanted to keep black people enslaved. Now here's the point about education. So what we are gonna do is, it's not enough for y'all to have this museum. So we are building a book, a book, and we're sending it to every school in the state there of Mississippi. You go. There you go. Every school in the state of Mississippi. And we're saying, before you go into that building and get told something that's not true or get told half of it, because the big elephant in the room is that the state flag is not there because they don't want folks to see it. So we're going to say, here's a book that tells you everything you need to know about your state flag. And we are approaching this as, folks, everybody in the state of Mississippi needs to know this Mississippi Statement of Secession by heart. So what we're going to do is, we're going to do everything we can to make that so. And we done pass them out to y'all. And who paid pay for the book? Who, who paid for, for it? The book. That I'm talking about? No, that Mississippi is going to put in every class. I'm paying for it. <laughs> With Which the help of y'all. Right. right. So here's what I want to do, because the last question actually is going to be our marching orders. The question is, what are the actions that New Yorkers can take to help uh, you in, in, in the work of changing the flag? What do you need us to do beyond care? Anjana, please. You have to. Is that the last question? That's the last question. Mr. Uh, did, Mr. Robinson, did you want to talk about did you want to talk about uh, Lee Atwater a little bit, and talk about like did you well, want to talk about that a bit? Well, you're still going to give the marching orders. Okay. All right. I think what you're referring to is uh, many people in this room may recognize the name Lee Atwater. He was a Republican consultant Hold up. for. Who knows about Lee Atwater? Three people. Who knows about President George H.W. Bush? That's who got him elected. Well, and he also got Ronald Reagan elected. And in 1981, so this is 1981, Lee Atwater is recorded talking to reporters. And he literally says, now y'all don't quote me now, okay? And the reporters say, okay. And he goes about to say Records. this. They, put, they press record and he says, see, in 1954, you just said nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger, it hurts you, it backfires. So you say things like states' rights, forced busing. And now it gets really ambiguous so that you're talking about cutting taxes, I'm gonna get his southern accent, and all these other things. And while it may hurt black people more than white people, I'm not saying that's not part of it, but it's so abstract that race is going on the back burner no matter what. Because forced busing is a hell of a lot more abstract than nigger nigger. And he actually laughs at the end of it. Now you say, what impact did that have? Ronald Reagan was nominated in 1980. The first speech after his nomination he gave in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the three civil rights workers were slaughtered in 1964. And the topic of his speech was states' rights. Every person in Philadelphia, Mississippi knew exactly what he was talking about. And so did Ronald Reagan. And so one of the things, because I want to give it back to you in terms of what can people do now, you can educate yourself about our true history. Right. I have, for the last seven years, I have gone around this country giving speeches about the history of race in America, mostly to PhD level audiences, audiences much bigger than this. And when I go through the facts and I ask people to raise their hands if they knew those facts, no hands go up. And I'm not saying any of this like I'm so smart because I know this shit and you don't. Because I'm 61 years old. And many of these facts I didn't know until I was about 54. Because I was never taught them. I went to Marquette University and Harvard Law School. I have one of the best educations in America. I was never taught Mississippi's statement on concession from the United States. I was never taught what Tennessee said. I was never taught what all of the South states Carolina. said. And what they said, this is why I'm saying, if you go back to our history, what you will see is that 
the Americans in our past were not concerned about political correctness. Nobody was getting on them saying, hey, you can't say that stuff. It's really like white supremacist stuff. They weren't embarrassed about it, so they just said it. They said exactly what they thought. And in my view, part of what you can do is to start educating yourselves and educating your children. Because I guarantee you, your children aren't being taught this. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you they're not being taught this. And I'll add Lee Atwater later after George H.W. Bush was elected president. He named him head of the Republican National Committee. And Lee Atwater is considered to be the creme de la creme of Republican political operatives. So you ask what can do? Uh, qu quickly, I saw someone mouth the words where, like where do we find this information? Um, I mean, of course, Google and all of these things, but I, do we have something up on the site where people can go? Is that part of the marching orders? Proceed. Well, for, well, for, well first, hold up. First, if any of you are speaking in Mississippi, if you're going to a conference in Mississippi, if you go do any of those things, you should say, um, Remove, if that flag is in the room, I need that flag removed before I speak. Again, public stances. That's, that's critically important. Second thing is, even though, again, I'm looking at the economic apartheid uh, movement against, uh, you also can utilize spaces where you are raising dollars as well to assist in these particular efforts. Three, what you can also do, mobilize and organize wherever you are, whether you're a student here or, where, or, or wherever you live as well, not only educating folks there, but also saying to your city councils and county governments, like some people have done, uh, if don't use taxpayer money for events taking place in the state. I don't know how some people disagree with that. Uh, I, I know do for, not disagree with I, that. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying some people do, but again, that's one of the things that you do. Now, somebody say, well, that's not fair. How many city councils said, they, and how many companies said they were not going to spend money in North Carolina because of the transgender bathroom? That was just last year and the year before that. The NBA canceled the All-Star Game in Charlotte. There used to be a massive protest in Mississippi. I think the, I think the NCAA protest still exists, but they, they will not hold any NCAA events in Mississippi they that, won't hold championships, but championships. They have games all the time. Championships. And so that so that still exists as well. And so that's also the kind of pressure you can apply because there's only one federal government, one federal agency that shares along with the White House, the Treasury Department. If you want to understand America, power, White House, Treasury, money. Money and power are there. You hit folks in the pocketbook, they have a way of responding. And just quickly, um, once you have gained enough information where you feel confident, uh, use your voice. Use your voice and your families and your circles and all of these things. Speak truth to power. Be that brave person to call people out on their bigotry. OK, here's a homework assignment. All right. So um, do, OK, got it. All right. So um, uh, did, did you, everybody get a handout? Everybody got a handout in the program, okay. Um, in the program, okay, the back sheet right here. The back sheet, y'all see it? Right. Everybody got it? In, in the church we say, if you don't got it, say wait. <laughs> Everybody got it? In the black church we say that. In the black church. <laughs> Let me clarify. At the Black Folks Church. <laughs> okay. With the MLK funeral fan phone. Stop. Fans. Okay. All right. So y'all see this? Yes. yes. Okay. So one of the things that's happening right now, real quick, the Mississippi State Legislature is in session right now, and they're going to be in session until mid-April, Genesis, do you know? Okay. All right. So at least until April, which is Confederate History Month in, in the state of Mississippi. So... You have here information for Governor Phil Bryant. You have information for House Speaker Philip Gunn. You have information for Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves. Okay? And this right here, this script, is a sample script that you can use. 
And what we're asking you is to call these folks and tell them that you want that flag down, okay? You can use this words or whatever comes out of your heart. Okay. Don't cuss. Can I just get some names? Can, can somebody just raise your hand to say, I will do that. I will do that for you. I will do that for Mississippi. I will do that for Mississippi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, the next thing I'm asking y'all to do is to ask somebody else to do it. Call who, somebody who you just like, anything you tell them, they'll do, like that person. Auntie. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, auntie, right. Your road dog. Right, right. your road dog, your ride or die. Ask them, I, yo, I need you to make a call for me tomorrow, by the end of the week, I need you to do this for me. I need you to call the governor of the state of Mississippi and tell him to bring that, bring that flag down. Okay, so next to this is another script. Okay, now this script is for the mayor of Washington, D.C., all right? In this script, you call the mayor of Washington, D.C.'s office. Some of y'all can call Mississippi. Some of y'all call, call the mayor of D.C. and say these words if you so choose or whatever comes out of your heart. The next thing, it should be a link on, on the site for, the, for this event. Call your state senator. While all y'all are from different parts of the world, call your state senator, senator and, in, and in, the senator from your state and insist that they introduce legislation post haste to bring down the state flag of Mississippi immediately post haste. Okay, don't, okay, don't, donations. So us lovely folks have started this in Mississippi, have started this organization called Take It Down, Take It Down America. We have a website www.takeitdownamerica.com www.takeitdownamerica.com Go to that website. We got a lovely little donate button. <laughs> if you feel so inclined, we ain't gonna say no. We will accept. That book that Roland was talking about that we're, we're sending out to all these schools, it takes, it, we gotta, it take, you know what it means, so. The rallies, the organizing. Yes, all that it stuff. All takes money. It takes money, and we've been pulling this stuff out of our own pockets. So if you wanna help with that, please do. Follow us at Take It Down America. We just started the Instagram page today. Take it down, at Take It Down America. Follow us, get your friends to follow us. Here's the other thing, if you are part of organizations, whatever that organization is, that has any measure of power, I don't care if, you're, if it's your roommates and your sweet, sweet you know, whoever they are, y'all are organization. You guys can combine your power and combine your power and, 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 and connect with us on the website, connect with us on Instagram, DM us, and say, we want to join y'all. We are having a rally in Mississippi on March the 6th at the Capitol building, on the grounds of the Capitol building. A lot of times these rallies, it just be like 20 or 30 people. We need numbers. Okay, which Capitol, state or federal? State. State. And hash, hashtag. Jackson. Hashtag any posts in social media with Take It Down America. Hashtag yes. Take It Down America. Yes. So if y'all want to come down March 6th, come down, rally with us. If y'all can't come, send go. So send your friends. Send some, that's what we need. We need numbers. and We need y'all. We need y'all saying the same thing that you said when, that, when the massacre happened in, in, in uh, South Carolina and there was national outrage mm -hmm. about that. You, what, we are asking, what we're asking of you is to see what's happening in Mississippi the same way you see what happened in Flint, Michigan. And what a lot of times what I hear with potential allies in this, in this battle is they say, well, we don't want to intrude because they feel like they're being northern aggressors, right? Mm -hmm. That's not, don't, don't hear it. Don't listen to that. Don't listen to that voice. We are all Americans. And what, what, hurts, what hurts some of us hurts all of us. So join us. Join us in okay. those ways. Real please. quick, Anjanu did, I mean, she's been in church. But... She ain't go to the right black church. Ingenue, how many books are you trying to print? Huh? How many, how many books? How many books are you trying to print? Uh, well, there are 82. Well, it was a lot of them. It's about 500, 500 plus. 500 books. What is each book going to cost you? No, no. Here's, here's what I'm saying. So 
you could literally fund in this room, let's say 20 or 30 of that's those right. books. And so that's what I mean that's in terms right. of being able to donate. Uh, so I'm gonna work with Anjanu on, the, on the, uh, the money ask, because Good. my wife is ordained preacher, so I'm gonna help her on that out. So we'll do that in, in backstage. Thank you. Can y'all please I help can raise me money. in thanking our panelists, attorney Jeff Robinson, <laughs> Roland Martin, Genesis B, and Anjanu Ellis. You have your marching orders. Thank you all for coming.